thank you so much. Thank you for um, joining us, representing the 9th Con Congressional District of New York, and also for introducing a bill that we hope will change lives, the Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act. We are thrilled to hear about this. Um, you know, we know that it's going to make a big difference in the conversation and in, in the awareness um, of talk about uterine fibroids. And so um, thank you so much for your involvement and for working to bring this up to the top in Washington is what we're hoping. Um, so I'd like to just kind of talk about uh, basically what we'll be discussing during this interview. Um, definitely the Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act, uh, community and involvement, fibroid awareness and initiatives, the health disparities in minority communities and access to quality health care, big one, and the impact of fibroids on women's health. So I'd like to start off by um, asking you a question, Congresswoman Clark. You're a sponsor of the Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act, introduce, introducing the bill to Congress in March of 2020, um, followed by Vice President Kamala Harris introducing it to the Senate. Why is this legislation so important to you? Well, this, import, this legislation is extremely important for a number of reasons. We know that between 20 and 30% of women of reproductive age have been clinically recognized as having uterine fibroids. And the, the screening studies indicate that the prevalence of uterine fibroids, particularly in black women, may be much higher. Uh, when I first came to Congress, uh, that I had a colleague, Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, who is now deceased, who had actually introduced legislation to address this issue back in 2007. Um, and what, what was ironic about that is that when I arrived in Washington, D.C. in 2007, I arrived carrying fibroids. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's personal for me. And I felt that, you know, for some reason, uh, this condition is it, it, not something that's widely recognized. It's not something that is discussed regularly. Uh, you know, my own mother didn't really have any uh, lens into what fibroids were. So it, we, we didn't have it as a hereditary condition. And so I thought it was important uh, that we raise the level of awareness, education, research, and information. Because as I went about my travels, I began to recognize that condition in other women. Yeah. And I understood what it meant because I had personally gone through uh, having uterine fibroids myself. Um, so I think that it's no secret that Black women develop fibroids earlier, have larger and greater numbers of fibroids, and even experience even more severe symptoms than their white female counterparts. So this legislation will provide for research and education on uterine fibroids so that we can find a way to combat what I consider to be a very devastating public health crisis within uh, the crises that we all face, uh, particularly for women in reproductive uh, years, in their reproductive years. Absolutely. Um, I believe that if we can find an avenue for early detection, that can most certainly be life-changing for so many women. And with that said, um, I understand in the act that um, one of the organizations that you've mentioned is the National Institute of Health, specifically the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, and so we talk, when we talk about education, about fibroids, now we're talking about a younger age group, which is definitely something that I know Dr. Yan has um, been conversational about. Um, so Dr. Yan, one of the goals of the Fibroid Act is to create awareness about the fibroids, but definitely between, uh, definitely talking about the education uh, behind uterine fibroids for uh everyone overall, but definitely for those of younger age groups. You've definitely talked about educating women between the ages of 16 and 26. Why is it so critical to reach young girls during that age group? I guess it's personal for me too. I have two <laughs> girls, I want the best for them. Yeah. And it's hurting to know that uh, there's a inequality of opportunity to pursue happiness when someone 
we, we understand the men and women a little different. And women cares children, has periods, and it's it's a it's a lot tougher on her body. But many women have a worse life than others because of the fibroid. It's so common. And what happens that those conditions are either not discussed or, or normalized abnormal. So people think it, it's okay to suffer. Mom, grandmother, aunt, everyone had this. It's normal. So why young? It's so common. African-American women between ages of 18 and 30, 26% already have a symptomatic fibroid. Interestingly, whites have two, 7%. By age of 35, 40, it's 60% African-American and 30% whites. And then things become more or less equal by age of 50, 80% of, of blacks and 70% whites. So when it hurts young women, and its most common treatment is hysterectomy, to me it's crime against humanity. You know, when we have a call, so a 26 years old girl calls us crying, do you have any, uh, do you have any option for me? My gynecologist recommend hysterectomy. I don't have kids. I'm not even pregnant. That hurts. You know why it hurts? Because I know different. I know that uterine fibroid embolization that can be done in the office, we do it, and based on four, about 4,000 uh, uh, successful uterine fibroid embolizations, we know that 30, 40 minute procedure ambulatory in the office can fix and and create the quality and that's it basically cure there is a cure for fibroids it's curable disease if we attend to this early we'll provide the full potential and the girls will not suffer from physical symptoms mental stress social discomfort 35 percent of women don't have a normal sex life how can they no family very difficult. And that's why if we educate early and tell about that abnormal things, not normal, and there's a cure to this, and everyone can find two, three hours yes. for 30, 40 minute procedure, and that's done in the office, covered by insurance and majority of managed uh, Medicaid, and just that. So this is very, very important. Right. And uh, that was a miracle when I heard ab about this. Uh, but I guess I wasn't aware about 2007. So, and we were so frustrated. We started Fibroid Fighters. We've done everything what we could, created fi USA Fibroid Center. It is proposed. I think we, we must work together. We have a solution and you have a means that will enable us to make everyone aware of this. Absolutely. And Dr. Jan, let's double check. Is your video screen on? Yes. It is. OK. All right. OK, so it's just. Can you see me? I cannot, but yeah. that's OK. <laughs> as I, can, long as I, I can see him. OK, fantastic. All right, mm -hmm. fantastic. OK, and so, um, you know, with that being said, um, with the education aspect, Dr. Jan, um, let's talk a little bit more specifically about reaching out to that younger generation, perhaps through something like health education. Would you agree? Absolutely. Health education is very important. Again, I have two girls, so they went through health education. That's mostly done in the physical, uh, you know, part of physical education. That's and they definitely talk about, you know, STD. They talk about periods. But nobody talks about uh, ab about uh, abnormal periods. Nobody talks about fibroids. And uh, my girls went to uh, schools in in the South Chicago area, and they actually called the uh, director, school directors, and and they were approved to give a talk. They spoke with more than 800 kids, girls and boys, and when we start talking about this, girl said, oh yeah, no, my mom has it, everyone has it, and people were very interested. Today, in digital age, 
we have to spread awareness and make sure that everyone from youngest age is responsible for the body. How do we do it? From education, given knowledge and tools to make the right decisions. Absolutely, absolutely. And Congresswoman Clark, um, for a woman who has experienced fibroids herself, when you think back on potentially having this type of information when you were younger, um, do you find support in this conversation introduced by Dr. Yon to have this type of health education earlier in school age girls? Absolutely. Awareness and access means uh, uh, the possibility of, of combating otherwise unaddressed public health issue. And one of the challenges we faced has been sort of the, the insidious way in which this condition develops in young girls. Um, you know, it, it, over time, uh, it, it, it's a, a compounded situation. But you, you know, as a young person, you're not recognizing those changes. And we are not doing as, as good a job at educating particularly young women of color about their reproductive health. And it's, it's ironic because, uh, you know, back in uh, the early 2000s, 2007, the procedure of uh, embolism had not even be, been put, put forth into the public domain. So the options were either uh, uh, removing the fibroids or removing uh, your uterus. Uh, and the, the information has to talk about at, at what stage um, one needs to seek treatment. Because uh, for many folks, they wait until, uh, you know, it, 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 life is just totally unbearable. And at that stage, you're, you know, you're progressing through your reproductive years. So this type of education is, is critical. And our primary, primary care physicians, our gynecologists, everyone should be talking about the whole person. And uh, for, for girls and women, that means reproductive health. Uh, and that's what our bill is intended to do. And I'm so glad to know that there are fibroid fighters out there that are doing that work alongside. And it's about time. You know, uh, this is an old age old condition. It's interesting because as a younger woman, I, I worked with uh, a, a, another uh, public servant who also had fibroids, but there was no conversation about uh, her sharing her experience with, you know, the young women around her. So we, we, we didn't understand the significance of what she was going through. And, and how it challenged her uh, as she proceeded through childbirth and a whole host of other things that she ultimately, um, you know, uh, endured while carrying fibroids at the same time. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that the work that we're doing here in terms of policy making in Washington, D.C., and the work that uh, advocacy organizations and the medical uh, professionals are doing to, to open up the aperture on understanding what this condition is and then having the research done so that we can uh, come forth with clarity around how to treat this condition. Um, I think it, it, it's a win, win, win. And I will also say that uh, we know that people are delaying uh, seeing medical professionals because we're in a pandemic. And, you know, time is of the essence when you're carrying fibroids. And unfortunately, it's those same vulnerable communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic that are delaying seeing their medical uh, professionals uh, may not even have access to, to, to uh, uh, primary care, gynecology, may not even have access to medical insurance. So the pandemic has laid bare a lot of the healthcare disparities that exist and embedded in that are women's reproductive health. And as a part of that is an understanding of what uterine fibroids are 
and how it impacts um, the life and the livelihoods of women. Absolutely. And um, it's important that you also mentioned, um, you know, conversation around the topic just doesn't exist much and hasn't exist very much. Why do you think that is? Why is it that certain medical problems such as uterine fibroids or anything dealing with a women's reproductive health system, miscarriages, topics like that just aren't really discussed? Well, I, I, I believe it's because, you know, we've, we've lived in a male dominated society for a very long time. And unless the conditions impact men, um, oftentimes we, we don't hear about it. And, and, and I, a lot of it has to do with how we're conditioned in our society. And our society conditions us uh, to be, be squeamish when it comes to women's reproductive health. Um, and uh, women absorb that as well. So they're not going to be as inquisitive about what is happening with them medically, particularly when it comes to reproductive health. There are so many pressures bearing down on the freedom of women to be able to express themselves and that very significant part of their health care. You have a headache, we all know how to treat that. You have uterine fibroids, uh, you know, might have to come back later or you might have to have a hysterectomy. This is unfortunately where we are at this stage of human development in, in our civil society. It doesn't have to be that way. We, we need to liberate women in a way in which they can get answers, that they, they're asked the right questions. You know, when, when young women go in to see a gynecologist, why isn't that part of the questioning? Are you experiencing heavy menstrual cycles? Do you feel something different? Let me examine your abdomen for this condition. These are things that can be taken care of, but we have to make sure that women have access to uh, uh, medical professionals that are sensitive and also knowledgeable about this condition and how it can be treated. Absolutely. Dr. Yan, I'd like to address this question with you first. In what ways can we support uh, the women who are suffering from uterine fibroids? And actually, I kind of, it's, it's kind of more of a Black community as a whole as well, um, from a medical standpoint. How can we support women and listen to their concerns as it relates to health conditions? Congresswoman Clark, you said amazing things. You just repeated exactly what I was saying to everyone. If men for prostate would, would be recommend little amputation, that would be uh, with fibroids, his tracksum is illegal and recommended. This is absurd. This is absurd. Now, I want to tell you that one of the reasons when people as a doctor right how do we doctors make decision doctors make a decision because should based on risk and benefit the same way other people make a decision the risk and benefit so if people don't see any benefit if all they know that you suffer 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 but treatment is worse than disease like hysterectomy and for sure no babies it, it is worse than okay maybe Everyone knows fibroids number one reason for miscarriages, right? But okay, maybe I have a chance without uterus, I will not have a chance. Using fibroid embolization is 2% of treatments. Two thirds are hysterectomy. Third, other minimal invasive things. It's terrible. So if people will understand that there's a treatment that's easy, nothing, our local anesthesia, a mild sedation, go home, so, okay, this is a, a, a treatment, there's a pill. If you have a headache, as you said, people will take aspirin, they will not go for, you know, head removal, right? But with uterus, I'm saying those things, it sounds absurd, but it's the same thing, it's bizarre what's going on with the medicine. And, and it's okay to talk this way. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned education, not to patients but the physicians. See, if I'm a hammer, I see the nail. 
if I'm a gynecologist, I do hysterectomy, and in my hands, from options, I myomectomy, hysterectomy. Uh -huh. So women go to gynecologists for certain things, and gynecologist has the tools. They don't go to interventional radiologists. I don't know how many people know about specialty in the interventional radiology that actually provide procedures. Those people work in the dark rooms. But that's the progress of medicine. You see, there were surgeries, then minimal invasive surgery, but now most of the things can be treated through tiny needle hole. And interventional radiologists have a wonderful license to make holes everywhere for any part of the body. So if we'll connect the dots, give specialists who do the treatment to women who suffer, it's, it's a win. That's why we have almost 100 locations in 18 states and 40 in New York City alone, just to connect the right doctors to right patients. Next, how do you know the benefit? You, you know the price is low, right? You feel nothing. Easy. What do, you, what do you think is a benefit? So if you understand, this is not just the pain, but there's a lot of things physically, symptoms, especially in the minority community. African-American women have a more incidence, bigger size of fibroids, more symptoms, anemia, high hysterectomy rate, and even after myomectomy, two and a half times more complications and 2.3 times more anemia. I funded research two years before the bill and paid people to do the whole evaluation of literature and came up with many, many very specific answers that amazed me how much opportunity we have to change the world. And that will explain women that it's physically, socially, not having families, not having children, mentally. If women cannot go uh, out, wear white, go out and first thing, if they more than 15, 20 minutes outside the home, they need to look for bathroom. Why not talk about this? Small bladder doesn't, this thing doesn't exist. It's just pressure for fiber that you need to run either to, you know, urinate or, or change uh, uh, hygiene, you know, it, it, it's, it's bad. Now I want to talk about other things. I want to talk about equal opportunity in life, career, life development. Absentees, you know the cost of fibroids? You need to tell this to Congress. Cost of fibroids is 25% cost of diabetes. You know the biggest cost? Direct cost, indirect cost, indirect cost absenteeism. Women cannot go to work. If they cannot go to work, does it put a sequel with men? Even if they have the same wages? Not, because most people hourly employed. If they don't go to work, they don't get paid. That's how inequality builds compound, as you mentioned, compound inequality that can be fixed. So if we'll educate about different phases of suffering, physical, emotional, mental, social, uh, financial, independence, uh, fertility, and you have easy solution. And by the way, diagnosis can be in majority cases done by just ultrasound, transabdominal, transvaginal. MRI is good, but majority can be with a qualified ultrasound tech. Absolutely. And anyone can do it. So I think if we'll educate people, that would be amazing, absolutely doable. There is no unknown that we need to invent peel, invent treatment, invent vaccine. No, nah. we have a solution. Hopefully, even better solutions will come. But yeah. even this solution today can be applied as long as people know about this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Yan. And I think one of the most recent studies by the National Institute of Health mentioned that the cost of fibroids is anywhere between 5.9 and 34.9 billion dollars, depending on what variables you're including. But even at 5.9 billion, it is a, a ridiculous and remarkable number out there um, when it comes to the cost of uterine fibroids for either an employer or a, a patient or a physician. Um, and that's something definitely that has to be addressed. And with that said, that's a great segue into um, asking Congresswoman Clark about increasing funding and research. How critical is it for us to increase the funding and research and public education as it relates to fibroids? Yeah, I mean, we, we can't do this on the cheap. We see where that's gotten us, right? Um, it's important that we invest in uh, the education, the research, 
uh, the accessibility to folks like Dr. Yan, who you know can provide uh, uh, guidance to women, to young young girls as they approach womanhood, so that you know they're prepared with the education and information they need to navigate their own health. Um, you know, I, I, and accurate information. Uh, like I said, I think we've we've come a long way. Um, with respect to treatment, we want to get to, 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 you know, what causes um, uterine fibroids. We want to understand whether certain living conditions create uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the growth uh, of fibroids. We want to get down to it so that, you know, we can unpack it for everyone and that it's, it's a part of our conversations. You know, we, we talked about how different genders, health uh, is, is spoke about in the public domain. For, for women, you know, it, it's almost taboo in our society because we have, we have created sort of this respectability politics around women's health and women's bodies, particularly during their reproductive years. Absolutely. So resources are critical. We got to make sure that every corner of this nation, there are uh, specialists and, 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 and there is a connection, as Dr. Yan has said, it, because it, it's not just, as he stated, uh, you know, primary care gynecology, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, 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 the uh, allied healthcare professions that really specialize in treatment uh, should be leading these conversations. Uh, because again, uh, we don't know what we don't know, but there are those like Dr. Yan out there who do know, and they need far more exposure that requires resource. Absolutely. And I actually hear a strong connection between yourself, Congresswoman Clark and Dr. Yan. Perhaps there's a way for you all to collaborate, to talk about how to make education about uterine fibroids widespread for younger women and perhaps maybe talking about building some type of education program. Um, you know, just hearing the both of you speak passionately about it and knowing my own experience as well, if I would have known about something like this when I was younger, um, perhaps I wouldn't be two myomectomies in <laughs> right now. So, uh, you know, definitely want to um, put that out there as a possibility. Um, and Erica, we, we have a vehicle right here in Washington, D. DC. Myself, Congresswoman uh, Robin Kelly of Illinois and Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman have established a Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls. Yes. And as as it would as it would, uh, you know, as it would happen, Congresswoman Robin Kelly of Illinois heads up Black Women's Health. She's also chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust. And so that's the sweet spot right there. That's the intersectionality. And we do a number of presentations, would definitely want to connect with Dr. Yan, and we could lift up the, the legislation while at the same time educating and informing and bringing together uh, those within our collective communities that have been really focused on the healthcare imperatives of our community. Absolutely. Um, Congresswoman Clark, uh, we know that uh, you work very hard to foster relationships between the United States and the Caribbean community. Um, as a proud daughter of Jamaican immigrants um, and co-chair of the Congressional Caribbean Caucus, um, many women, maybe many Caribbean women are suffering with fibroids. Um, as a physician, Dr. Katz Nelson and his staff see a lot of Caribbeans and Islanders in the New York area. What more do you think needs to be done to help this population of women? Well, uh, you know, we've, we've said it here. It, it, it's all about education, all about education. And, and mind you, when you are, you're an immigrant, you come from, uh, you know, civil societies where some of what we're talking about is also prevalent. So that many of the, the women from the Caribbean region uh, have seen other women press through, work hard, all while being 
uh, you know, uh, carriers of, of uterine fibroids. And so it has been normalized to a certain extent in, in those civil societies where they, they don't have access necessarily to the latest in terms of healthcare and health information. And in those societies as well, we're talking about male dominated societies where, you know, it, 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 it's not, uh, uh, you're not readily accessible to women who would have these conversations. So I think, it, again, the education campaign that we've been talking about throughout this interview is just as important, and particularly in immigrant communities where, you know, they're coming into a sort of a new uh, civil society, the systems that are set up to provide uh, uh, services, uh, they're navigating and just learning about what that navigation means in terms of their own personal health is important. I, and let's, let's also be honest here. Most women, particularly women of color, uh, women who are immigrants, they are so busy tending to others that they don't stop to tend to themselves where yeah. their health is concerned. And that's why I think you, you, you have uh, things get to such a desperate stage before it's addressed. Absolutely. Dr. Yan, hearing Congresswoman Clark speak, it made me think about my own experience of visiting your USA fibroid centers in the New York area. And I think I just want to take a brief moment um, for you to just kind of explain how, I don't know if simple is the right word, but how accessible the fibroid centers are and where they're located in the U.S. Because I think there's a, there's a tie there between the accessibility question and um, and, and treatment options. So can you talk a little bit about your fibroid centers? Absolutely. Uh, by the way, I'm double immigrant. And, uh, you know, I, I English my third language. And uh, so I, I exactly understand what you're talking about. It, it's, a, it's tough to be in a new country. It's tough not to understand language. It's tough to worry about your family. You know, women always put themselves last. And anything we can do, that would be great. I really liked your think about education. I'll answer a question about our centers, but education, because it's important to understand when you have a big problem and you start solving the problem, you, you, at least I think, what's possible, what's not, what's known, what's unknown, what's easy, what's difficult. And let me tell what's possible. We built USA fiber centers because there's a known technology that can be easily done in the office. Okay, so we have ex and we work on accessibility. What is accessibility? Accessibility, it's that you have availability of location of time. So we, that's why we have, for example, in New York, we have locations in 18 states, mostly in inner cities, because we enjoy helping the worst sick patient in advanced condition. You know, the miracle of medicine is a magic of healing that you take someone with a big problem and we make them healthy, healthy. I liked it when I was doing a heart surgery. You stop the heart, you fix it, and that's better than before. That's amazing. Now I feel we did the same thing with the vein treatments, with the wound care, and absolutely deja vu, it's possible to do with a fibroid condition because technology is available. So if we'll build a bunch of centers, everywhere available within one, two blocks from public transportation. Now, these locations, how about we'll make them open seven days a week, early morning, late evening, beyond regular business, nine to five hours, because it's not about doctors. I'm an important doctor. I'm very smart. I can do this. No, it's about patients. When they were put patient first and serve them. That's very, very important. So we put locations, make them work open seven days a week, and provide technology that's easy that they can go home two hours later and back to normal life a couple of days after that. Now, next thing, so that was availability. Next, affordability. You know the miracle is? Uterine fiber embolization is covered by majority insurances and uh, even managed Medicaid. There's a few minor complications. Interventional radiologists and many managed Medicaid, for example, in New York, in your district, they have closed panels. And the insurance says, we have enough 
and nobody wants to talk because they're thinking about heart, cancer, COPD, diabetes, big four. They don't understand 50 billion plus expenses. And you know what? If people would know that they can be health and they have a disease instead of normal suffering, that would be $500 billion expenses because it's such a common condition. So it's affordable mostly. If we'll allow interventional radiologists not to be ever part of closed panel, because that's how insurance can allow patients to have a right treatment. Second thing, I definitely need to talk to Congresswoman uh, Kelly, because in Chicago, it's weird. And I'll tell you what I think. It's not something absolutely bad intention. It's because didn't ask. You know, America, if you want something, just ask and bring <laughs> and, and explain why. So Medicaid covers, Medic managed Medicaid's cover your fee in the hospital, but not in the offices. Right. No good explanation why. New York, almost except a couple of states, it's allowed everywhere except Illinois. Why? I don't know. Just need to ask. So these tiny things, if we can fix, that would be fantastic. Now, imagine, let's say in New York, everything is good. You know, you have centers, you have this, but without awareness education, they're no good. Right. If people don't go there, if people go to slaughter for hysterectomies, now 40 million women have symptoms. 10, 15 have a severe symptoms. 90% postponed the treatment because they better suffer than hysterectomy, but 500, 600,000 have hysterectomies. So if we'll educate and small tweaks, small tweaks with the, you know, a little insurance access, you know, credentialing, a little approval here and there. Oh, I have an idea. Thanks to you. Metrics, metrics, government has mandates for things that government pays, right? You pay, you're the boss. There's metrics about blood pressure, smoking cessation, obesity. How about we'll put the metric, if government pays, please make sure you check fibroid symptoms. Uh -huh. make, make sure that, you know, why not? You pay, you're the boss. You can ask this, totally normal, totally fair. And suddenly it becomes absolutely part of examination, of every examination. Now, it doesn't matter what specialty, what doctor, you have to talk about, you know, weight, about diabetes control, about if, if patient has diabetes, smoking cessation. You have to talk. That's part of basic things, like checking blood pressure. That needs to be a basic thing for any woman of reproductive age. Talk about this. If Congress mandate, if, if that will be part of things, I think then, wow, we need to measure something, gain something new. Okay, that's the first reaction. Second, what is it about? Oh my God, how much we can even miss easy options. Then doctors will know, a lot of professions will know, and patients will know. So, Congresswoman Clark, everything is up to you. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, uh, Dr. Yan, it's up to uh, the American people. It's up to women. It's up to uh, all of our allies. To speak up. Exactly. To speak up and, and to be aware of the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act. So that that increased awareness makes it an imperative. Um, and that's what we have to do. I think that women suffer in silence. And when you're in your silo and you're suffering, you don't realize how many other women are suffering as well. And, and, and through that community of interest, we can make a lot of change. And that's, that's why I'm in this. That's why I'm taking up the mantle because I personally know uh, what it is to have one's you know, health compromised. Uh, in this way and at, you know, uh, such the prime time of your life. And so I really want to make sure that we, again, widen the aperture, demystify um, what this condition means to women, to black women, to immigrant women, uh, to women who are suffering in silence.
Absolutely. That is um, just the heart of everything we're doing here, Congresswoman Clark. So I just, I really want to thank you.